Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming here for this uh, wonderful event. You had a preview already. Uh, I think it's going to take uh, long, and uh, according to Dr. Green, he's going to answer a lot of questions after his talk, so keep asking. Uh, so, I'm personally very, very excited about uh, this event. Uh, it is, just to say the truth, I mean, it's, it doesn't happen very often to someone's lifetime to share the stage with a uh, NASA person, and uh, <laughs> not mention that he is the, uh, 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 the chief scientist of uh, NASA. Uh, it's, a it's a pretty special day for everybody and for everybody that got involved into organizing this event. And we are really, really excited having Dr. Green here. Uh, just a bit of background about uh, the event before this. It's, um, the event and talk is part of the university's effort to bring uh, some of the most inspirational figures uh, to inspire young people, the next generation of uh, scientists, uh, engineers, thinkers. And uh, there is nothing more uh, inspiring than NASA, to say the truth. Uh, it is, uh, uh, so the opportunity to invite Dr. Green here was for a public lecture was an incredible event and uh, we were really excited when uh, we got the call from the embassy uh, about uh, his visit and uh, the fact that he can give this uh, public talk. So uh, we would like to thank with this opportunity uh, the U.S. Embassy for uh, making this event uh, uh, happen and also the Cyprus uh, Space Exploration Organization. Uh, as you know, the last few days there is a, a summit here with uh, top scientists and uh, officials from around the world yeah. where they talk about uh, the future Mars uh, missions and uh, how you can bring the whole uh, planet, all the, all the scientists from around the world together to plan for these missions. Uh, so, I, since you don't want to, talk, to, to listen to me, uh, I, I will introduce our speaker and I will say a few things about uh, his uh, bio. Uh, actually, I had to write them down and cop because uh, there are so many things and <laughs> I will forget most of them. So, uh, Dr. Green uh, got his uh, PhD in space physics from University of uh, Iowa in 1979. And uh, soon after, in 1980, he started working in uh, uh, NASA. Um, in the magnetospheric physics branch at the Marshall Space uh, Flight Center, where he developed and managed the space um, physics analysis network that provided scientists with all the uh, data that uh, were being received, and there was a very fast uh, access to this uh, data. Um, between in 1990, from 1985 to 1992, he was the head of the National Space Science Data Center at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, NASA's uh, largest uh, uh, space and science data archive. In 1992, he became the chief of the Space Science Data Operation Office until 2005. Uh, when he became the chief of the science proposal uh, support office. Uh, Dr. Green was also a co-investigator at that uh, period uh, and the deputy project scientist on the imager for uh, magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration image, uh, image mission. From 1992 to 2000, uh, he was also the deputy project scientist for mission operations and data analysis for the global geospace uh, science missions WIND and POLAR. Uh, he has written more than 100 uh, uh, scientific papers, peer review papers, and uh, also uh, where he um, involving the, his articles uh, various aspects of the Earth's and Jupiter's uh, magnetospheres. 
and over 50 technical uh, articles on various aspects of data systems and computer networks. Uh, from August 2016 to April 2018, before he became the uh, chief scientist of NASA, he was the director of planetary science division at NASA headquarters, where he led NASA's solar system uh, exploration and uh, astrobiology research. Under his leadership, uh, several missions have been successfully executed, including the New Horizons spacecraft flyby of Pluto, uh, the Messenger spacecraft to uh, Mercury, the Juno spacecraft uh, to Jupiter, the Grail spacecraft to Moon, the Dawn spacecraft to Vesta and uh, Ceres, and the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars, just to name a few. Uh, over his career, Dr. Green, uh, he received several awards. Uh, in 1988, uh, he received the Arthur Fleming Award given the outstanding uh, individual performance in the federal government. In 1996, he was awarded Japan's Kotani Prize in recognition of his uh, international science uh, data management activities. He was also recently received the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal for the New Horizon flyby uh, of the Pluto system. Uh, he told me that if I talk more about him, he will send me to Pluto. So uh, I think my students are very happy about it. Uh, so um, I hope you all give a, a warm welcome to Dr. Green, and we are looking forward for his uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll. If we can get the lights uh, turned down a little bit um, uh, so that everyone can see the screen. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is just give you a little flavor for what's happening uh, in NASA missions. We also work well with many of the other space agencies and I will, as we go along, um, try to point out some of the things that um, uh, we do together and, and what's, what's been happening. Well, we're gonna start with the sun, and of course the sun uh, has a cycle, and it's called the sunspot cycle. And this is where uh, magnetic fields on the sun poke out, and that area is cooler by several hundred degrees, not a huge difference in temperature, uh, and they look black. And so when you look at these two images, it doesn't look like the sun is tremendously active. Yeah, it has some spots on it, but um, this is the surface of the sun. This is the surface that we see, but where is the real action on the sun? The real action on the sun is indeed in its atmosphere. So once again, on the left, no sunspots. We call that solar minimum. And on the right, solar maximum. So now let's look at the upper atmosphere. And we look at the upper atmosphere in a different wavelength. And in fact, we need spacecraft to uh, go and look at the sun at these wavelengths because these wavelengths in, in ultraviolet light and x-ray cannot penetrate to the ground. And so this is what we see. On the left is solar minimum and on the right is solar maximum. And so even with a few sunspots in solar maximum, now we look at what we would call much more of an angry sun. And the sun can be very active at times uh, during this cycle, and primarily during the uh, move up to and around uh, solar maximum. Now it takes about 11 years for the sun to go from uh, solar minimum through solar maximum and then back down to solar minimum. And today, uh, our sun is just now leaving solar maximum and starting to become more active and we see, starting to see some sunspots on it. What are, the, what are the kinds of activity the sun can do? Well, this is one, it's called a solar flare. And uh, really shown quite well here. 
in the atmosphere of the sun, the upper atmosphere of the sun that we call the corona. On the left is the normal corona during uh, an active sunspot period. And within minutes between these two images, we see the intense light coming from a very specific area that's typically above a sunspot and it's a solar flare. This is where magnetic field energy is converted into particle energy and we see a whole stream of particles flying up into uh, the solar wind and into the rest of the solar system. Now the sun constantly outgasses even during solar minimum. It like, it's like it exhales. Now there's so much matter in the sun that even though it exhales and it loses matter, it's a very, very small amount. And it's been doing this for about 4.6 billion years since really the sun came together. Now early sun, we believe, was much more active than it is today. And so we would expect it to be even angrier during solar maximum. Uh, but indeed today, uh, we have to put up with, when we travel from one planet to another, these solar flares. Now there's another phenomena on the sun that we call coronal mass ejections. Now the way we observe these is um, uh, once again from spacecraft. And here we have a, 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 uh, an image for which we have blocked out the intense light from the sun. And we've made a circle. That would be the size of the sun. And then everything that we see in this image is what we call scattered light. So as comets come in and fly around the sun and as small pieces of, of meteorites are moving in orbit around the sun, they scatter light, and indeed we're looking at this scattered light coming from uh, the region in and around the sun. Now this is a movie, and so let me play this movie. Now it is moving uh, not in um, time as we know it, but very rapid time. You know, there you, we're going to see about a month's worth of data, okay? And so here it is. And as you can see, there'll be uh, extreme events that'll happen. There's one. There's another one off to the lower, lower right. And this is when the sun uh, will create a bubble in its atmosphere of material, and then it is blown off into space. This, is, this happens three or four times a week during solar maximum and then maybe one or two times a month during solar minimum. So this is, uh, this is the sun perhaps at its worst. And so let me give you an idea. These look like a huge events, you know, very huge events. And we've modeled them because once you have a bubble of atmosphere of the sun and it moves out into the solar wind and comes towards the earth, many different things can happen. And so this is what we call space weather. So humans leaving Earth, going out into space, our spacecraft leaving Earth, going out into, into places, Moon, Mercury, you know, Mars, etc., anywhere, are really being buffeted by the space weather that you are actually seeing here. So here's a simulation. Here is the sun, and um, uh, we're going to generate a coronal mass ejection, and it is this bubble of material, and it is going to move up the solar wind. And so there it is, and as you can see, uh, this bubble can be quite huge, and it only gets bigger as it moves away from the sun. So where is the Earth? Well, the Earth is very far away from the sun, and now we see this coronal mass ejection coming to the area of the Earth. So where is the Earth? There it is. <laughs> is 
And now let's see what happens when this coronal mass ejection hits the Earth. Magnetic field lines around the Earth change their positions. They have to rearrange themselves because of this turbulent mass of magnetic field and matter hitting the Earth. And every time that happens, we see spectacular aurora. We see these from space station, we see these from our spacecraft. And the real severe storms, these aurora will move down to low latitudes. And under certain circumstances, we believe in the past that these storms have been so strong that you can see aurora in Cyprus. Those are extreme space weather events that will have a major problem with our electrical systems here on Earth. And so one of the things that we want to study more is all about uh, space weather events. Now we have a satellite. It's called Parker Solar Probe. Here it is. And its mission is to fly to the sun. Its mission is to go near the sun and study these events. Study the coronal mass ejections. Study the flares and study the area above the surface of the sun in the atmosphere where the solar wind begins. Now this is a pretty spectacular mission because I have to tell you, the sun is pretty hot when you get close to it. And so, how close will it get? Now here is actually a real picture of um, the sun during a, a total solar eclipse. And in this case, it's the moon that's covering up the disk of the sun. This was taken not very long ago when we had a huge total solar eclipse uh, crossing the United States, which hadn't happened for nearly a hundred years. And so how close are we going to get? We're going to get within 10 solar radii. The region where we believe we'll begin to see how that solar wind is accelerated, in particular during those times of solar maximum when the entire upper atmosphere of the sun moves outward and looks as mean as it does in those images I showed you. Now, how are we doing that? Well, we launched this spacecraft uh, only a few months ago, and here it is. It's going to get a gravity assist at Venus, and then it's going to pass around the sun and loop back out. Now, it will continue in orbit around the sun, and make many, many passes over the next six or seven years. And each pass, it will get closer and closer to the sun, making these exciting measurements. So this is really the start of a mission to the origin of space weather, something we've never done before. And it's really quite an exciting mission. Well, let's move out from the sun and of course, the next planet uh, is the planet Mercury. Now this is a, a beautiful planet. It's more moon-like than any of our other terrestrial planets like Mars or Earth or Venus. And indeed, it is uh, quite beautiful in many ways. Uh, these data were taken by the mission Messenger and uh, ESA is launching a mission tomorrow, actually, called Bepi Colombo to go back to Mercury and continue studying where we have left off. This body is very important for us to understand, and we have many mysteries. It is um, a, a, a body, a terrestrial body, that has a core that's bigger than our core. And yet, this is a much smaller object. It is larger than our moon, but much smaller than the Earth and smaller than the planet Mars. And yet, it has an iron core 
that's nearly the size of the Earth, and we don't understand that. We don't understand that. This moon, or sorry, this planet even generates its own magnetic field. And so this is a really fascinating body, and uh, we've just now started to uncover some of its secrets. The next planet is our sister planet. This one is Venus. This is a spectacular planet. And although NASA has had some missions in the past of Venus, it's been really other space agencies that have really made enormous progress studying this beautiful planet. The European Space Agency has had Venus uh, Express there for many, many years, and only recently, as its fuel ran out, it was brought into the planet. The Japanese Space Agency has a spacecraft there now. It's called Akatsuki, and it is making measurements of Venus, and so we want to continue on understanding this beautiful planet. Now, it's very cloudy. Uh, we can't see the surface from uh, a visible light, but there are certain wavelengths that allow us to look to the surface. But in reality, to get the best image of Venus, we need to have a radar. And our radar that we did uh, was called Magellan, uh, and that mission flew many years ago in the 80s, and it made pictures like this once we gathered all the data after many, many years and passes. Now, this is the surface of Venus. It's colored. It's not meant to show you exactly the color, unlike Mercury, where we showed you the variations of the color and the mineralogy on its surface. This surface, we really uh, uh, don't know everything about it to give you the real idea of what it looks like but it is colored in what we call elevation. The blues are the low areas. The reds and the whites are the upper areas. And because we're able to create maps like this, we then can fly through these databases and really take a good look at what the surface of Venus looks like. And here, here is a pass through some of the areas on Venus for which we see huge volcanic mounds. Now, we don't know if these are active and if they're still spewing uh, carbon dioxide and other volcanic material. But Venus Express, that ESA mission I talked about, seemed to indicate several of these areas with big volcanic domes are very warm warmer than the area around, and therefore, that leads us to believe that they have been volcanically active, maybe today, but certainly recently. So Venus is unfortunately uninhabitable. This is an incredibly hot environment. It's so hot on the surface of Venus, it can melt lead. The pressure on the surface of Venus is 90 times our own pressure here on the surface of the Earth. Now, you may not think that's too much. We move around, it's pretty easy, you know, at our pressure. But 90 times the pressure of the surface is like going in our ocean approximately 2,000 meters down. It's crushing depth, and it requires, you know, huge large structures that can withstand these high temperatures and high pressures. Venus also has a layer of sulfuric acid that also makes it very difficult to bring uh, satellites through that area and land on it and have them work and survive for very long. So this is a planet of extremes and our scientists early on as we studied Venus recognized some of the major reasons for why the planet is the way it is. It is undergoing what we call a runaway greenhouse effect, where indeed sunlight penetrates down to the surface, warms it, 
and that changes that light into infrared heat and as that heat tries to leave the planet the atmosphere won't let it leave and so it does nothing but heat up it's very much like your car during the summer when you open the door and sit in it and it's very hot the window is opaque when you have uh, infrared heat heating up your upholstery it doesn't go out of the windows gets in but can't get out after it heats up the interior that's Venus well if I told you this was Venus you may not believe me but we now believe that Venus in its past looked like this about 3.6 billion years ago when life started on earth we believed Venus was a blue planet was an ocean world and it has lost its water over time this planet a sister planet of ours with all the same makeup and initial conditions much like the earth has evolved differently and these are the things we want to understand more because what's happened on Venus can happen on earth and yet that evolutionary track was so different is it only because it's closer to the Sun or is it due to other factors and so we need to model the planet we need to understand it and we need to understand the processes that has changed a beautiful blue world like Venus into the hot uninhabitable world it is today all right we all know this guy or gal it's the earth it's our beautiful earth it is the gem of the solar system it is where life exists in abundance at this time all right as I showed you Venus as a beautiful blue marble may have had life in its past when we think about going out in our solar system and we look for life we do that looking for life if it exists today but also looking for signs of life if it existed in its past these planets have undergone evolutions and so we must understand how they have evolved to understand if they have harbored life in their past well the earth is um, uh, a planet we study extensively and we have more NASA has more than 20 satellites making all kinds of observations and those observations are very important and we're accumulating that data and we're combining it with many of the other agencies and we're learning an enormous amount about the processes here on earth okay and that also allows us to compare with uh, the other planets now this is the moon you know our clo closest neighbor and it, it's both sides of the moon so on the left you see the moon as you would uh, if you walked out uh, tonight and it was clear it may not be clear it looked a little uh, cloudy uh, uh, late this afternoon and and on the oh sorry that's on the left and on the right is the far side of the moon now some people call that the dark side of the moon and they would be wrong okay the far side of the moon undergoes phases just like the near side of the moon does and in these two examples what we've done is we've accumulated all the data when the sunlight was shining on each of these sections now these two look very different we see the dark areas on the image on the left we're very familiar with them we call them Mari you know these are these actually are lava that is filled in cratered impacts okay and they're huge areas of lava that have poured out of this moon and filled these areas 
We don't see that on the far side. These craters are really quite clean of lava material. And we believe the fact that the Earth is tidally locked, where the gravity on the near side has a significant pull to the moon that over time impacts force the lava to come to the near side. In addition, we also feel that the far side, which has a larger crust, also inhibits the magma, what we call lava uh, here on Earth, but we also call it magma on the moon, filling in the craters. So by going back to the moon, we can get the impact record of the moon, and that impact record is the record of impact here on Earth. Now, when we look at the Earth, we don't see craters everywhere, all right? Our biosphere has eliminated nearly all those craters. We can, from space, find certain areas that are cratered shaped that actually are ancient impacts on the Earth that are still seen from satellite missions today. But by and large, our biosphere has really eliminated that view. So the record of, to, of these bombardments, we don't have on the Earth. And to understand these bombardments that have happened on the Earth, we really have to go to the moon. We live in the same area. And so when material comes in and bombards the moon, it also bombards the Earth. We measure 100 tons of meteoric material fall on this planet every day, every day. Things from dust to grains to football-sized material and even larger fall on the Earth. And so, where does this material come from? And how does it relate to uh, the evolution of the solar system? That record is on the moon and we want to know about it. Now here's another view of the moon, and it is, a, it is a colored, and in this color is in the same vein where we have blue as very low spots, and the reds and the whites are very tall spots. As you can see, it's that far side of the moon that has the, the deepest holes and yet the highest mountains. The difference between this blue area and the white area, not too far away, is greater than any height difference on the Earth. It's about 15 kilometers. If you were to go to the top of Mount Everest and then down in the bottom of the Marianas Trench, that's only about 12 kilometers. So this is huge in height variation. What's exciting about this blue area, as you can see, it has this round shape. This is actually an impact crater. So a huge object hit the backside of the moon. In other words, the moon was running block that day. It didn't hit the earth, it hit the moon. And it blew away an enormous amount of material. This is a really exciting area because it is the lower crust or the upper mantle of material. Now we can't get to our own mantle of the Earth and yet mantle material is laying on the far side of the moon. And under pressure, the, the mi minerals that we have here changes significantly as you move through uh, the surface down towards the bottom of the crust and in the mantle. And so all kinds of new science and new materials and new structures may be discovered by bringing back material from that far side. So this is really a fabulous set of observations. Now, there are people that believe we've never been to the moon. Okay? So I hope maybe I can convince you uh, we have a satellite, it's called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It can measure 
that podium right there and see it if it stood on the surface of the moon. And so when we fly over these regions where the Apollo sites are, we see some really amazing features and, and wonderful history to think about. Here's the lunar limb. Now this is the, the bottom stage that was on the surface when we blasted off of it, okay? And if you look closely, the white things that are laying outside it are the backpacks. They threw their backpacks off, got into it. We also deployed a whole variety of experiments. And uh, we can see how the astronauts you know, walked over and deployed these elements. And each of these made all kinds of different types of measurements. Uh, we also went to other spacecraft that landed on the moon. This is the surveyor. We landed several surveyors on the moon. And uh, uh, we went to some spectacular features. Each and every place on the moon that we've gone, we've brought back samples. And these samples are in our archive uh, in what we call our curation facility. They're maintained under nitrogen and we lend them out for, to scientists all over the world to study. We brought back approximately 800 pounds of rock and we're still studying it and we're learning an enormous amount about the origin and evolution of our solar system because of that. Now, our next step is that we are going to return to the moon. This administration, through Space Directive 1, it's called, has said we will go to the moon and then on to Mars for humans. This is our human exploration approach. And we will do it in a sustainable way. Now that means when we go back to the moon, we're going back to stay. This is the next space station we're developing. It's called the Gateway. Here's the Orion capsule that will bring astronauts up to the Gateway. And many of the other space agencies are beginning to uh, think in, uh, about how they would contribute and have made uh, suggestions on what they will do and, and over the next year or so we'll sign agreements and then together we'll build this structure. This will use the most advanced ion engines we've ever built and they will be designed uh, to take this vehicle to uh, Mars or something similar to it, maybe the next generation of Gateway. This also will be in cislunar space, well away from the Earth, and we'll be able to see the far side of the moon on a regular basis, allowing us scientists to send experiments down to the surface and really interrogate the moon the way we would like to and get, uh, indeed, tease out all the questions uh, from the observations we want to make. Well, here's the next planet in that sequence, and this is Mars. This, this, this object is bigger than our moon. It's about half our size. It's a fabulous planet. It's the only terrestrial planet that we actually can go to, live, work, grow plants, survive, and return from. It is a gift that has been given to us as we explore out into the solar system. And a lot of the things that we're learning by going back to the moon, we will apply when we go to Mars. So what about the history of Mars? You know, I mentioned by going to Mars and these other planets, we're able to figure out some of the history of Mars. And what we found out is that over time, since Mars was created with the Earth and all the other planets and the Sun 4.6 billion years ago, Mars went through several periods, and this period in particular, Mars retained an enormous amount of water. It too was a blue planet. 
But something happened, climate change occurred somewhere around 3.5 to 3 billion years ago, and it changed from a water world into a more arid world that it, we see today. Not all that water left the planet. We're finding out, in fact, the meeting we had here this week in Cyprus was bringing the top scientists in the world, young scientists, many of them, that are studying how Mars changed from this blue planet to the arid world it is because much of its atmosphere has escaped. Mars lost its magnetic field early on and perhaps that enabled the solar wind over time to erode the atmosphere. So we are learning how this goes by studying our data from our spacecraft. Uh, what happened to the ocean is as it evaporates, water is transported and then rains, and that keeps the water in a water cycle. But if you break the cycle, if it evaporates and then gets disassociated in the upper atmosphere, where oxygen might get to the point of being stripped out of the planet, you cannot then form that water again. You've lost it. And then once it goes out in the solar wind, it never will come back. Now Mars has an enormous amount of water underneath its surface. Uh, in fact, most recently, the Mars Express spacecraft, which is from the European Space Agency, has found a huge body of water underneath the surface, approximately 15 kilometers, uh, and they believe from the observations that it is liquid water. I think that is the start of finding more water systems like that in aquifers on Mars. There's much to say about uh, the possibility that aquifers are maintaining a fair amount of water underneath the surface of the planet. Now in addition to that, the northern polar cap of Mars, we believe also maintains an enormous amount of water. And in fact, it has a veneer of carbon dioxide that's keeping it trapped. But as the sun heats up, that carbon dioxide will sublimate. That will increase its greenhouse effect. The atmosphere will warm, and we believe the polar cap in the northern hemisphere will melt, and one-seventh of the ancient ocean on Mars will return. And it will be a much more hospitable planet uh, at that time. Now that's going to take several hundred million years, so we're, you know, these are planetary scale uh, discussions we're having here. But indeed, uh, Mars holds a lot of water and a lot of resources that we can use for human exploration. Now in the meantime, we have a number of satellites that have been on the surface that have operated. Uh, all these in red no longer are operating. Uh, and, the, and Spirit and Opportunity were, were the two rovers that were identical. We landed in two different locations. And uh, right now, Opportunity is struggling to come back. Uh, we have gone through a major global dust storm, and that dust storm has now abated. Uh, and so the, we believe there's a fair amount of dust on the solar panels. And so Oppy, as I call it, and many of us call it, is struggling to get enough energy to get that battery uh, heated and begin then to uh, turn on the antenna point it back to Earth, uh, and call home, okay? And it hasn't done that yet, so we're a little worried. Um, we're going to keep looking for the next um, month or so. Now, Curiosity is working great, and the next one we're going to land on November 26th is called Insight, and it's very close to where Curiosity is. And uh, the uh, ESA is landing the ExoMars rover, which will be right here. And we have another rover like Curiosity, it's called Mars 2020, and this week the scientists are meeting 
to have the big discussion of the three big sites that, that, that are being chosen. And in another week or so, we'll hear their recommendation. And then we'll, we'll pick one of those three sites and I can put it on the map and tell you where Mars 2020 will go. Now, where was the ancient ocean on Mars? Well, this is once again colored such that the blues are low. And so the ancient ocean on Mars, the shoreline is right here in the yellows and the greens. All right. And so when you look at several of our missions, they are on the shoreline of the ancient ocean, the location where perhaps life left the ocean to move out onto the land. It gives us an opportunity to study this area to try to understand if life got a hold of Mars early on like it did Earth. But of course, only to die out because of rapid climate change. Once again, we study these planets because what's happened on them may happen on our own. And this is why we need to continue to look at them and understand the processes. As I mentioned, Mars has lost its magnetic field. That may be the reason why the solar wind strips the atmosphere over time. And we now know here on Earth, there's indications that our magnetic field is starting to weaken. We are familiar with this process of weakening and then flipping. We can see it in the rock record here on Earth. It's happened many, many times. And we may be entering an era where we will lose our magnetic field for a period of time. The geological record says that the flip happens very fast. But if you ask a geologist, how fast is that? They will say, well, anywhere from 10,000 years to 100,000 years. That's fast, okay? So that may be a very long time for which the Earth will not have a protective magnetic field and the solar wind processes that we are measuring at Mars right now may occur here on Earth. And we just need to know what's going to happen, okay? Once again, by studying these planets, we understand the future of our own. Now this is a curiosity. It landed in a crater called Gale Crater. This is a spectacular crater. And it has a, a, a system that bores holes into the soils that are there. And then that material is brought up and brought into the instruments. And we taste those soils. We tease out what are the elements. And we understand then what the mineralogy is. How the elements are connected together to form certain minerals. There are 4,700 or so minerals here on Earth, and 300 of them can only be made if you have life. And so by looking and teasing out these minerals and figuring out are they the same as Earth, we're also looking for life in the soils of past Mars. Here is um, the first two boreholes. These are the size of a small coin and a depth of a couple centimeters. And the soils are pulverized so that we can analyze them in our experiments. And when we did this, we were absolutely shocked to what we found. All around Mars is red, but these soils just below that veneer of red are gray. This is gray Mars. Mars looked more like the Earth than ever before to us. When we tasted the soils, it had carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. The elements we ourselves are made of are plentiful on Mars. That tells us this environment could indeed have harbored life. In fact, the area that Curiosity is sitting in 
uh, is really full of sediments that have been in water, filtered out, and are laying on the ground. And we're probing those, and that tells us about the water. The water that is in this area, in its past, was not salty. You could drink that water if you went back 3.6 billion years. If we brought earth microbes and put them in that environment, they would have grown and survived. It's truly a remarkable set of discoveries that Mars in the past was much more Earth-like than we ever imagined, and that its future may be that humans from Earth will populate this planet too. Here's what we think has happened to Mars over time. As I said, this is the heart of the discussion, the big science discussion we had this week, bringing all these experts together that without a magnetic field protecting Mars, that perhaps a lot of the atmosphere has been stripped, never to return. And so it is, uh, uh, surface pressure is much lower than our surface pressure. And uh, the water has evaporated where we've broken that uh, cycle. Uh, and um, that's why it is as arid as uh, it appears. Well, as we move out a little further, the next planet I want to talk about is Jupiter. We have a mission at Jupiter right now. It's called Juno. Now, this is an image that's taken from Earth. It's uh, from one of our big telescopes. Jupiter is absolutely fabulous, uh, fabulously beautiful. But here's another picture of Jupiter taken by Juno. And as you can see, uh, this is uh, the southern hemisphere. And it is very different than we ever imagined. In fact, when we take a good look at both the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, the poles, we see huge cyclones. And as you can see, these cyclones are bigger than the United States. They're absolutely enormous when we, when we bring the Earth in, in this picture to show you the sizes. So this is a spectacular set of data that we've put together. Now, in addition to that, uh, we have looked underneath the surface with a variety of instruments that can sense heat, and we have imaged the cloud tops, and we have combined that data into this movie that I want to show you, okay? And so these are, these are indeed based on real observations from uh, Juno. Now, here we are skimming right over the cloud tops as we're moving from high latitudes down to low latitudes. You see the scale on the left uh, tells you how far away we are from the surface. And soon we'll penetrate through the clouds. And we'll begin to go underneath the clouds. Uh, in this particular area, it's extremely hot. The temperature just roars right up. The composition changes. We see a lot of ammonia in certain regions flowing up to the surface in some of these zones. And then when we pop out of the planet, we come up to this particular area. And this particular area is the great red spot. Now this is um, uh, also really a beautiful storm. It's enormous. In fact, you can put pro approximately two complete Earths side to side to cover the size of this storm. So this is like a hurricane. It actually, the clouds uh, extend above uh, the cloud deck around it. And it's just a fabulous set of observations that we have made about this planet. And there's many surprises. We're also quite interested in these moons. Now, these are the moons of Jupiter. Uh, there are many more, you know, many dozen, many dozen more. But these four, called the Galilean moons, were, so, were seen by Galileo in his telescope in 1611, okay? And they're Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And these moons were all made at the same time. 
Now, when I look at that and somebody would tell me that, I would say, nah, how could that be? They look so different. They look so different because they receive different energy and that energy has changed their surface significantly. The energy they receive is from Jupiter and it's a tidal force. These moons are in elliptical orbit. Sometimes they're close to Jupiter. Other times they're further away from Jupiter. And the gravity from Jupiter squeezes them when they're close and then releases that when they're further away. And that squeezing back and forth, that tidal force, heats the interior of these moons and changes their surface. Now, all these moons, when they were created, had an icy crust on the outside. They collected water, the very tops of the moons, and rocky material was in the inside. And now when we look at them, Io in particular, which is the closest moon to Jupiter, there's no, there's no ice shell. This moon is so hot, it has dissipated its ice shell. It is gone. And this body is volcanic. Now Juno has taken a number of really great pictures of Io. Here's one, and it's taken it in the infrared. And this area that you're looking at is mostly the night side of the planet, sorry, of the moon. And you can see the volcanoes. There's more than 100 active volcanoes on Io every day. And in fact, as that material rises up and sloshes back down on the surface, changing the surface features, you would need a new Google map of Io every 50 to 80 years, okay? That's pretty bizarre. Now, Europa, is another beautiful moon. We'll talk more about it, but it is still has its icy shell. In Ganymede, also the largest moon in our solar system, generates its own magnetic field, is one of the most fascinating bodies in the solar system. That moon ESA is going to, and NASA is going to Europa. And together we'll study these moons and make some fantastic observations. Now, the reason why Europa is a fabulous moon to study, and ESA will be flying by making measurements here at Europa also, is that when we look at this moon, unlike our own moon, and in fact, this moon is about the size of our own moon, I don't see but one crater on it. There's only one crater in this image. It's right there. What happened to all the craters? This moon is resurfaced, resurfaced itself, literally, just like Io has, but not on that same cycle. And that has meant that water must be liquid underneath that icy crust, has come up through those cracks, and has fallen back down on the moon, and indeed has filled these craters in. We now know from our observations that there's twice as much water underneath the icy crust of Europa than there is on this Earth. So this moon has an enormous amount of water. Water is so critical to life as we know it that that makes this moon an abode or a habitable environment that may be an abode for life today. We believe life started in our ocean and moved to the land and this moon has been this way for 4.6 billion years. If it's got all the right stuff and all the right elements, maybe that spark happened on this moon too. And it comes alive with life. We're, we want to find out. We want to find out. As we move further out in the solar system, here's Saturn. This is an image taken by our Cassini spacecraft. And I want to point out uh, something. You can just barely see it. And that's, that's this northern pole. You can, see the, you can see this shape. It looks like a hexagon, actually. 
but it doesn't look anything like Jupiter. Jupiter has all these storms and it's chaotic like crazy. And, and now what we see is this. Now this is also a gas giant. This is about the size of Jupiter, smaller, but you know, it's a huge planet, it's a huge body. It's the second largest body in our solar system. And yet it has some of the oddest structures I can, I can imagine. This hexagon is a jet stream. And it, and it moves around the planet like this. And we've now done an extensive amount of research in this area, and I can tell you this. We don't understand it yet. We're clueless. So somebody out there, you know, one of the kids in your school is going to crack this open, and we'll learn a lot from what they find out. That's what we'd like. Now, at the very center is this enormous, it, absolutely enormous hurricane, all right? This is bigger than the United States, you know, the whole United States. And, and we can see the cloud tops, and we can see even individual eddies and storms that are, that are uh, in, in these, uh, in these uh, larger structures. So this is really pretty phenomenal. Now, other satellites in the Saturn system, like this one, Enceladus, have also uh, intrigued us. This body has very smooth features in the southern hemisphere, but in the northern hemisphere has a number of craters. So the crater density ought to be equal all over here. Obviously, the craters here have been filled in. And in fact, we, we love these stripes right here. We, you know, scientists have really technical terms sometimes, and um, sometimes they don't. We call them tiger stripes. Okay, that's what they look like. And um, indeed, when we get close to them, this is what we see. Coming out of these tiger stripes is a wall of water, geysers, if you will, that go up more than 150 kilometers. Now, most of this water comes sloshing back to the moon, but some of it leaves the moon, and it is all ice by the time it comes out of this crack because the, the, the space is so cold around it, and the parts that leave, the little ice particles that leave, form this ring, this is, and here's, here's Enceladus right there, and it's spewing this material out. This ring is called the E-ring, okay, maybe E for Enceladus, but what's spectacular about this wall of water is that it, as it rises up, we can fly through it, and as we fly through it, we have tasted this water. Now, we don't have the equipment on this mission to look for life, unfortunately. We had no idea this moon was going to show us this spectacular uh, set of uh, events, this water world. But we do find that there's a lot of rocky material and a lot of food, uh, like molecular hydrogen, that that small, you know, small microbial life on Earth just loves for food. And this rocky material, we believe, is coming from hydrothermal vents. So at the very bottom of the ocean on this body may be dotted with hydrothermal vents. Now, hydrothermal vents were discovered here on Earth in 1978. And we believe there's thousands of them, 10,000 or more, and we have visited 300. And each and every one of those, we take all kinds of measurements. How salty are they? Uh, how alkaline are they? You know, What's the acidic level of these areas? And some of them are very acidic and some are not. But they all have one thing in common. They are teeming with life. And it didn't require the sunlight for that to occur. So these are exciting discoveries on Earth that when we look out in the solar system, we see potential areas like this where we could go and perhaps get in the ocean and find life. Now another moon I want to talk about, and we're getting down to the end of our 
discussion here is this one. This is Titan. This is Titan. Titan is the only other body in the solar system that has liquid on its surface. This is uh, Mari Kraken. Uh, you can see uh, the liquid in this radar image where we've gone through the clouds down to the surface, reflected up, and it's nice, smooth. Uh, some small waves exist, but it's not, not, not extensive. Uh, but this is not liquid water. It's liquid methane. Now, as I mentioned, liquid is really important for life here on Earth. Water is. And in fact, life uses that in the metabolism process. You take in water, take in food. Uh, the water uh, helps extract the energy. Water is also used to eliminate waste. And that's one part of life that we know. If, if you metabolize uh, and you reproduce and you evolve, we're going to call it life. So if there's any place in the solar system for which that liquid is substituted for something else, like liquid methane, and life grew in a way that was completely different than our own, it's on this spot. It's on Titan. Titan is huge. It is larger than the planet Mercury. It has an extensive atmosphere that's twice as dense as ours. And if we pulled it out and it orbited the sun and not Saturn, we'd call it a planet. So this is a fascinating body that we, we plan to go back to. We have started a new line of, of scientific research based on alternate life and, and whether life could spring up in this area based on the resources we see and the liquid methane that's there. And we call that new field of research weird life. So we have a lot of weird life scientists out there that are really doing a great job making, making some progress and understanding what we might see. Now, another mission I want to talk about is New Horizons. It is the one that flew out into the Kuiper Belt. This is the, a brand new region beyond our gas giants. In my lifetime, we found a new region of our solar system. Tens of thousands of objects are out there, and some of them are actually pretty big, like Pluto. Now, Pluto is smaller than our moon, okay. And indeed, it's uh, one of these objects that is out in the Kuiper Belt that we observed first in 1930. But it was in the 1990s when our telescopes got so good that we began to see Pluto-like objects beyond Pluto itself. Pluto is uh, right here at about 40 astronomical units, and the Kuiper Belt exists out to maybe 55 to 60 astronomical units, where one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Light travel time from the Earth to Pluto is four and a half hours. Four and a half hours. It's that far away. Now, what did we find when we flew by it? So here are some real data, real images of Pluto as we flew by Pluto. This is an absolutely spectacular moon. And indeed, as, uh, there, there goes the sun, and the sun uh, lit up uh, the planet as we look back. And this shocked me. This is another shocker. Pluto has an atmosphere, and it's not a small atmosphere. It's actually a rather extensive one where all sorts of chemical reactions are going on. And in fact, it has a variety of complex carbon molecules that are created in the atmosphere because of the sunlight breaking up certain molecules that then recombine into other things. And, and we can see these layers in the atmosphere. We also don't see any craters in this area, and that's because Pluto is also an active body. It's a living world, just like several others that we've pointed out today. And here it is. This is the beautiful Pluto, and we see nitrogen ice. This is a glacier of nitrogen ice 
with combinations of methane and carbon monoxide ice. This stuff moves on the surface about the consistency of toothpaste, okay? But it does modify the surface and fills in craters. And we see these red areas. Now these red areas are really exciting because in that atmosphere where we make carbon chains and they get heavy, they fall to the ground. And if you were standing in this area, this actually is the equator uh, of, uh, of Pluto, right in through here. If you were standing there right now, today, it would be snowing red tholins. And we can make these in the laboratory, and they are red. This is a fantastic body, and it's still evolving. And it's, it's four and a half light hours away from us. Now, finally, where is our Voyagers? Our Voyagers are the furthest spacecraft that are still active. And here's where Voyager uh, 1 is. It's popped out of the heliosphere, which is the area dominated by the sun's solar wind and its magnetic field. And it's out in an area now where it's tasting the winds from other stars. This is just astounding uh, a science. We see from an astronomical point of view these structures around other stars. These tell us they, they must also have heliospheres. And it's now an exciting set of new measurements we're making. And we're thinking that we need to go back out with, with, a, with a spacecraft that's dedicated to study this region of space. Voyager 1 and 2 uh, aren't, aren't very healthy. They, they have the, they're suffering from old age. Uh, they were launched in the early 70s. Uh, it's great that they're still going and some measurements are being made, but they're not designed to really uh, do the kind of science we'd like to see uh, in the winds of other stars. Well, that's kind of a short little tour of our solar system. It's really an exciting time to be alive. We have, in the last 60 years, uncovered a miraculous amount of information. 60 years ago, everything we knew about the solar system we got from the back end of the telescope, and now we've been to the major objects in our solar system. We've completed its initial survey, and we have so much more to learn. And I'm glad you're along for the ride. Thank you very much.